Hey guys, Steve Moran here for another episode of Foresight TV. I am with my friend Marsha, who is Yes Yes Marsha, which is I just think is the the cleverest. And I've actually <laughs> never asked you about that, so we're gonna probably have to do that. But before we get started, let's do this. Hey guys, Steve Moran here. I'm so envious that you have a cartoon of yourself. I want one of those. Isn't that pretty cool? <laughs> we just, we needed this little intro and a guy who's actually not with us is the one who started the process. And we actually had it built. We found somebody on Fiverr and has built that and Love it. the cartoon me has become a big part of sort of our branding and our logo and so it's it's actually i i i you know we've been using that for about six months and it still makes me smile every time it plays so uh, <laughs> uh and we we actually have got a new live stream we're doing called tech tuesday and we we've got him building us a new cartoon for that one as well it's not quite ready uh we're getting some final tweaks so i'm going to give you a little background about marcia um, I have been kind of, I'm sort of an aspiring keynote speaker and I worked with her about three years ago on a keynote that I got done just about the time the pandemic has hit. And so I've never really done much with it, but a few months ago, I got inspired to do another keynote, uh, called look to the sky. And so I reached out to Marsha and we have been working on this speech it's just got a little final touches on it it's probably the most amazing thing that we have ever done it was it was pretty good before i started working with marcia and marcia's turned it amazing and she's an amazing storyteller and i asked her to come on foresight tv because i think that one of the single biggest challenges that we face in the senior living industry is that we are we're horrible at two things we're horrible at collecting stories and we're horrible at telling stories. So I was at a conference yesterday in Southern California. This is not a slam on the conference or anybody there. There were a series of panel discussions, 25 or 30 speakers on the stage over the course of the day. And nobody told a single story that touched the heart. Lots of good information. Uh, I was glad I was there. It was a great conference, but I wanted to laugh, cry or grin someplace <laughs> one way and that never happened. So let's just talk a little bit about who you are and what you do. And then let's talk about how do people actually go about finding stories and telling stories? So um, I help people tell stories, as you said. I work with organizations and individuals. Sometimes it's individuals like you who are doing keynote speeches. Sometimes it's um, organizations who want their teams and their leaders to communicate better. Uh, because one thing about storytelling is if you're good at telling stories, it makes people know, like, and trust you better. Like it makes your the people that you work for like you more <laughs> um, or the people that you work with it makes potential clients trust you more and it's like a way of getting information across really um quickly and also like i think one of the mistakes people make with stories is they often think they have to just tell stories about the thing they're talking about and one thing that you're really good at in your presentations and one of the reasons i love working with you is because you will find analogous stories so it's like your look to the sky stories i don't want to throw in any spoilers for steve's keynote but essentially there's a big story up front and it's like it's a big story and there's no direct link to senior living but actually once he then explains to you why he's thinking about this and how he sees the parallels then it's like oh and you get it on this level you wouldn't have got it if steve had just said in senior living today day to day to day to fact 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 um and so I love working with people, you know, I love working with people like you on keynotes. I love going in and running workshops for organizations. I've been doing it virtually, of course, during the pandemic. Luckily, I have a very nice background um, yeah. where some people are like, is that fake? It's really realistic. And I'm like, no, no, it's painted onto the wall. <laughs> um, anyway, and so and so that's what I do. But I'm obsessed with stories and I'm obsessed with the power they have. And it's so interesting to me that you said, you know, nobody at this conference told a single 
story, not least because it's so easy to tell stories. There's this myth that, you know, you're born with the gift of storytelling or you're not. And that's just not true. It's a set of rules that literally anyone can follow. I've been doing this nine years. I have never had a single person come to me who wants to be a better storyteller and not sent them away as a much better storyteller because I just told them the rules. So, so I'm gonna, first off, I have to say, I have, I have a, a friend who's not in the senior living industry, so I'm pretty sure he's not watching today. And <laughs> he, and, he and his wife are the worst storytellers I have ever met. They start telling these stories, and they're always terrible at it. And I, they're two minutes into it, and I, and I, I stop, and, I, and I, I try to be polite so I don't necessarily say this. So, But I go, I have no idea what you're talking about here. But that's a very rare, that's a very rare thing. I don't think it's that rare. I think it's just that they don't know the rules. It's just that nobody told them the rules. I, I hear terrible storytellers all the live long day and then they work with me and then they're good. Like, it's not that I don't think anyone is bad at telling stories. I think it's that most people don't know the rules and it's everything from people putting in much too much detail. But actually to me, the much bigger sin is not putting in enough of the right detail. Like the stories that I hate are the ones where you're just skimming the surface. It's just a laundry list of events. And you're not telling me why I should care. Um, you know, really what you want is to have the right kind of details. And we can talk about what those are okay, to so make the person the care. I want to know the rules. Okay. This is interesting because I don't know that I've ever actually like sat down with you and broken them down like this because no, we just dive no. in. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm actually going to, well, I'm going to try, I don't know whether this is going to work or not, but I'm actually... I've got my banner uh, uh, creator up while you're talking, and so I'm going to try to talk, type them in, and put love them it. on the screen for a minute. As we're okay, going. I love Rule it. Number Rule number one: the most, the most important thing I can tell you. If you remember nothing else I say, remember this: when you are telling a story, you're making a movie inside your listener or reader's brain. I'm actually going to say that again, not just so that you can type, because it's so important. When you're telling a story, you're making a movie inside your listener or reader's brain. So uh, I'm going to break that down for you while Steve types up the banner. So, so if you think about movies, uh, there are three different kinds of scenes. You have voiceover scenes. So voiceover is disembodied voice from the future giving context or philosophy. So if you think about Morgan Freeman at the beginning of Shawshank saying, you know, there must be a con like me in every prison in America. Um, the guy who can get it for you. And and so that's voiceover, disembodied voice from the future, giving context or philosophy. Then we have montage scenes. So you think about like Rocky training montage, romantic comedy, getting to know you montage, like Hitch teaching the guy how to dance montage. Um, and, and montages are like real time scenes cut together with music done to show either passage of time and or something changing. And then there's action scenes. And by action scene, I don't mean car chase or space fight. I mean like literally any scene where everything is happening in real time, sometimes slow-mo, but usually real time, all from the perspective of one or a couple of the characters. So if you think about movies, most movies are mostly made up of action scenes, right? If you had a whole movie that was voiceover, that's an audiobook. You know, if you had a whole movie that was montage, it's like a very long music video. It's not a good movie. So they're mostly made up of action scenes and then you use the voiceover and montage to get from one set of scenes to the next. It's the same in storytelling. The difference between those three scenes in storytelling is to do with how much granular detail you get into. So um, voiceover disembodied voice from the future could be um, when I was 18, I went traveling around Europe. I um, visited nine different countries. I felt it was important to meet people from different cultures and expand my horizons. So you know what I did? You know my opinion on what I did, but as far as what that trip was like, you don't really know what that trip was like. Mm. Montage is little flash bulbs of pictures. So when I was 18, I went traveling around Europe. We drank red wine in Paris. We looked at the street art in Berlin. We walked the canals of Amsterdam. Again, you know more about what I did on that trip, but you don't know what it was like. But then um, action scene is getting super granular. It's saying I'm standing on the subway in Paris when this woman stands up and starts walking towards me and I panic because I think I don't speak French. What am I going to say to her? And then in perfect English, she says, I'm terribly sorry. You seem to have dropped your 200 franc note. So that's action scene. And that's where the magic happens. 
scenes. So I'd say rule number two is make sure you're telling action scenes. And the magic that happens is that as you're listening to the stories, your brain thinks the story's happening to you. They've done studies where they stick people into MRI machines and they look at their brains when they're being told a well-told story and their brains are literally responding like, you tell a story about smelling coffee, my olfactory cortex will light up. You tell a story about grabbing this glass of water, my motor cortex will light up, specifically the part related to hand movement. And when that's happening, and that's happening in my brain too, so then our brain, and your brain too rather, so our brains are going in sync with each other. And so that's really powerful connection. And I used to notice that connection when I would see, I run a storytelling show as well, and I would see, you know, it's a storyteller would tell a show, everybody's listening. And I used to call it alchemy. And then I realized once I learned about the brain science, it's not alchemy, it's neurology. And we've all had this experience where someone is telling a story in a big room, I and mean, it could be in a room of five people, it could be 5,000 people, and everyone's hanging on their word. There's this energy in the air, and the energy is just neurology it's everybody's brains lighting up in the same place at the same time like a giant benign alien invasion but it's really powerfully connective and that only happens when you're writing action scenes and so really telling stories is not about you know i i know a lot of people who teach storytelling who say oh it's about you know the the um the what's it called the, the the different you know the rise and fall or this archetype and that archetype but actually to me, like, it's great if you can do all of those things, but really just describe a scene. Just make my little brain feel like I'm in that scene with you and boom, you've got me. Like, I will listen to whatever you have to say in the rest of your presentation because I am right with you in that scene. So the way to write action scenes is, and this is this can be your number two, Steve, ask yourself two questions. What did it look like and how did you feel? Um, I just want to mention that Rachel said she's loving these movie references. I'm so glad. <laughs> I love movies, so I love being able to talk about movies. If you come to my workshop, sometimes I get people to act out the uh, scenes. Or I just play them. Oh, I can't hear you, Steve. My dog was barking. Uh, in the background. Your dog had some stories to tell. <laughs> what ask, what ask uh, number two? Yeah, so number two is ask yourself, what did it look like? And how did you feel? Those are the two questions. What did it look like? Question mark. How did you feel? Question mark. And so though, while you're typing that up, I'll break those down. So what did it look like is like, what what's the context? You know, who's there? What kind of room are you in? You don't need to describe every single world, word, but just tell me, are you by yourself? Are you with five people? Are you with 4,000 people? Are you in a giant cavernous room? Are you in a tiny cave? Um, just give us like a general context. And then... The, and so what does it look like is also anything sensory. So what did it smell like? What did it physically feel like? What did it sound like? We don't include every detail in stories. So you just have to have the things, you know, that's essential. Like if you're in a room full of people, are they children or are they, you know, middle-aged women? Like whatever it is, give us a bit of context as much as we need for the importance of the story. If it's not important, you can just be more general. And the most important one is how did you feel? How did you feel? How did you feel? Like that, I would say storytelling rule number three is you must include emotion because if you don't include emotion we do not care about your story if you just say you know i i got out of my car and i walked up to my door i saw a note on my front door my neighbor had left there and then i walked into the house then we'll be like okay but if you say I got out of my car door and there was nerves in the pit of my stomach, I walked up the path and when I got to the door, I saw that my neighbor had left a note and all of the blood drained out of my face. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. And I can't believe this is happening so soon. I pushed my way into the house and then we're like, what's, what's going on with the neighbor? <laughs> well, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of take just a little twist. I think I can do this without giving it away. So uh, in the story that I worked on, the big story, I, I talk about going out into my front yard on a Sunday morning and picking up the newspaper, the local town newspaper, and reading something shocking. And you really pushed me to talk about how I felt and how I reacted and it was really hard because I was like, I was reliving it. 
but it was clear that it made it much more powerful. And if you want to hear the rest of that story, you have to book my keynote, by the way. <laughs> and the other thing we did with your story was we went back, because originally when Steve brought me the story, he brought me that as the beginning of the story. But I had said, we've got to know why, we have to know why you care about the thing that you read. And, we, and also we have to care. Like I've seen this mistake made so many times in keynotes where somebody will say something and sometimes it's like somebody dies but I didn't actually even know they you know it'd be like somebody will say like oh my sister died and it's like you haven't even mentioned a sister until that point so it's really hard for me to care like obviously it's sad if your sister died but maybe you maybe it was your half sister who you met once when you were 20 and you've never seen since and you don't care about maybe it was your twin sister who you lived with your entire life like it's really hard for me to care about the person if I don't know about them or people sometimes put it in then they'll be like you know this person died well actually I knew them really well blah 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 but it's like you've lost the impact so you want to tell it in the chronological order you have to let us know what the stakes are to know whether or not we should care like when you have the emotion it draws people in because because it creates an information gap because we want to know what's going on with the neighbor and the note and actually what happens then is your brain starts their brains start getting flooded with um dopamine and oxytocin which is like makes them trust you makes them love you so that's great we love that tension you know it's it's what's happening when we're watching a movie and we're like oh what's gonna i can't go i can't go pee because i gotta find out what's gonna happen next um so it so it it creates tension it draws us in it shows us whether or not to care but for me my favorite thing that emotions do is that's how we connect to the story that's how we can reach in and grab any story because we haven't had every experience but we do know you know we haven't maybe we've never walked out onto our lawn and picked up the newspaper and felt shocked but we know how it feels to feel shocked you know we maybe we've never i had a storyteller recently i was working with on his story of um being a refugee have it fleeing the war in Somalia when he was a teenager for fear of being kidnapped by Al-Shabaab and then going and living for three years in a refugee camp in Kenya like I'm so privileged I have never had anything close to that experience but he talked about his fear he talked about his boredom he talked about his despair and I have felt fear I have felt boredom I have felt despair so I could connect with his story and really for me this is kind of my like so you know I'm teaching this stuff because it really helps lead and it helps people connect but why am I really doing this because I believe that lack of empathy is the root of all evil and that if people could truly empathize am I allowed to be a little bit political it's not a little bit political my my mother country I'm Russian just invaded Ukraine and I I, I um I'm I'm not into that and I mean I, I'm of the opinion that um anyway this is I'm, actually this is too dangerous for me to be too political no, but no 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 I'm just like I don't want the I don't want the uh I don't want Putin's cronies coming after you after Foresight TV <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> but essentially like I think that often people that make those decisions are either people who have no empathy or who aren't able to connect you know maybe not even that maybe you just have like a giant corporate company who are treating their low down employees really badly but maybe if they could connect if they had like an empathetic connection with those employees they might be like oh maybe we shouldn't treat them terribly while i live in my giant golden house or whatever it is and so storytelling literally creates empathy in other people's brains and so to me why am i doing this because i want to defeat evil and i think this is one of the ways we can do it I love that. I, <laughs> I just, I, 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 you know, I, stories just, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever learned anything that wasn't accompanied by a story hmm. because it's what, in my view, it's what locks that, that emotional point is, is, is what, what locks it in. So what's next? And so editing, let's talk about editing. Cause that's also a mistake that people make. So, uh, and these are, I think, really the most important rules. So when you're telling a story, you're making a movie to, to, you want that movie to be action scenes and to write an action scene, you ask, what did it look like? Slash smell, slash sound like, um, how did you feel? You must include emotion and then you have to edit. And the way to edit is to ask yourself, what is the point I'm trying to get across? And sometimes that point is, um, in scene, you know, if you're, a, if you're a leader in senior living, um, then you need to love on your staff uh, to take a lesson I've learned from Steve Moran. Um, maybe that's your point. Sometimes that point is my girlfriend spends a lot of money at Costco. 
Like sometimes that's the point, but you always want to ask yourself, what's the point of the story? Because that will help you edit. So say I'm, you know, say I'm telling a story about, oh, my girlfriend spends a lot of money at Costco. Um, I could tell about a story that we went to Costco and she's busy filling up, you know, our, our um, shopping cart. And suddenly this guy comes in wearing a full rabbit costume and starts break dancing in the middle of the store and everyone's gathering around him and clapping. It was amazing. Now, if the point of my story is my girlfriend spends a lot of money at Costco, do I need the rabbit thing? Does the rabbit thing help that point? No. So we, we cut it. We'll use it somewhere else. We'll use it in a story about how you never know when you're going to be surprised or there's different ways you can get attention when nobody's going to give you their attention. But you cut it from that. And in literature, they call it murdering your darlings because that's how it can feel. You're like, but that bit's really good. Um, but if you can learn to do that, if you can keep coming back to what is the point I'm trying to get across and then use that as like your guide, your beacon for does this stay in the story? Does it go in the story? What do I need to support the story? That's what's going to help you edit. That's what's going to stop you going off track. Well, I think about my script, right? So one of the things that I do, and this is one of the things I taught you, right? Was that that I know that there's always stuff that ends up getting put to the cutting floor. So I take it and I put in what I call the boneyard. And so I have this bottom section of my document and it's stuff where I go, I'm kind of in love with that. It's not the right thing for this particular presentation. Doesn't mean it should go away. And in some cases we went back to the boneyard, resurrected things, moved them around. And there's still, uh, I would guess that there are maybe five pages of stuff in the boneyard today, some of which will probably surface someplace else and some of it won't, right? So, and maybe that's the other question I have for you is sometimes I think people get fall in stuff, love with stuff that's not very helpful. How do you get past that? Uh, as in they fall in love with the story that you don't want to let go yeah. of. <laughs> so it was funny. I did a keynote a couple of years ago. And I can't coach myself, so I hired my friend Michelle Barry Franco. And I do think anybody who teaches or coaches should be a client at least once of their own discipline because she asked me all the questions I asked my I asked my clients. And with the exception of you, Steve, who you're a very easy client, but I gave her all the same BS answers most of my clients gave yeah. me. And I had a story at the beginning, and she was like, It's a great story. It's a powerful story. It's not right for this talk. I was like, you don't understand, Michelle. They need to be crying within the first 30 seconds. <laughs> like, And she was absolutely right. And I threw it out. And I think it's the way that I deal with it is, first of all, to tell people you're not throwing that story in the garbage. You will use it somewhere else. You know, have, have a, I learned from a coach years ago to have a book called Squirrels, which is for all the ideas, you know, dogs who are like, squirrel, squirrel. And, and uh, some of us are like that with ideas, you know, and some of us are like that with stories. So you have a book where you keep all your squirrels so that you can come back to them um so know that it will be used somewhere else and the other thing is to just keep asking you like what is my goal the two questions i ask any i ask a bunch of questions when i'm working with people but one of the most important questions i ask is what is your goal of this talk presentation you know keynote whatever and i always split that into two different departments and one is in terms of good in the world because most of the people i all the people i work with are trying to make the world a better place and the other one is in terms of what's bringing money or glory to you and and, and again, that helps you edit. So the, the good in the world, you want to make sure, like, is this serving them? And so when it comes to those stories, if your, if your goal is to create whatever the goal is in terms of good in the world, if you tell a story that's not going to work for that, then you're going to be less good at creating your goal. It's the same as people who might be like, well, why should I have to do a story at all? At all? You know, I just want to do facts. And it's like, well, if the story is going to help you get those facts in people's brains and cause them to take action, put a story in. Yeah, and, and I so so I want to actually I want to shift. Are there any other rules? Because if I want to actually want to shift to a topic just a little bit here. Go for it. Go for okay. it. Okay. So here's the here's the question I have. So I'm going to start with the story because I'm a storyteller. So I I would go to conferences and I would sit down, standing there talking to a uh, a, a CEO. I'm supposed to selling this in the present tense. I'm trying to add add it. So I go to conferences. And I'm talking to leaders, significant leaders, good leaders. And I look into their face and I ask, tell me a story that will make me laugh, cry, or cringe. Expecting great things. And after a long pause, 95% of the time, I get this response. There are so many 
Hmm. And so I say, I am sure there are just <laughs> only one. And it always ends the same. I just can't think of one right now. So I think people get overwhelmed. Okay, so Spotify, lots of people are boycotting Spotify, but most people I know listen to music, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, one of those. I don't. I download things onto iTunes because I cannot handle the stress of choice on Spotify. It's too much music. It stresses me out. It's the same as like going to a buffet. I find it overwhelming. I always eat too much food because I can't handle the stress of choice. Like there's a Russian part of me that's like FOMO. I can't bear to like give anything up. It's too stressful. So saying to someone like, tell me a story. But if you were to say to them, what's the best piece of advice you've ever had that you've actually used? Or um, have you ever practiced... Have you ever rehearsed a phone call before you've made it? What was the phone call you were making? Or who was the worst boss you ever had? Who was the best boss you ever had? Generally, I would say actually go with positive questions. But when you can zero in like that, then people are like, oh, you know, somebody asked me that question about the boss the other day. Who, who was your first boss was the question. I was like, oh, Dave and Angie from Southeast London pub landlords. You know, they were like... You couldn't imagine more perfect Southeast London pub landlords. Angie, really mouthy. Dave, giant, silent mountain, sat at the end of the bar, completely quiet until the end of the night when he'd yell as loud as he could, come on, everybody, for you, drink up, please. And I loved them. So, so it ignites such a story for me. Whereas if you had said to me, tell me a story about work, I might have been like, uh, uh. <laughs> and the specificity, I think, is what brings stories out. So, so I guess I, I you know, I, I hear this. We've actually had this conversation before, so I do want to say that. But I, I guess I'm going to push back a little bit on it because I think if you're a leader of people, you should have stories. Yes. Oh, pocket. no, I agree. I agree. You have stories in your pocket. And yeah. what I worry about a lot is that I think people are not very good about collecting stories. I and 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 it's something that comes fairly mm. honest, comes fairly natural to me. Um, I have sitting on my, you know, as, as you know, most of the audience knows. I at my church, I teach a bunch of fifth and sixth grade kids every Saturday, and I'm really good at it. It just it's it's a natural gift, and so kids can hardly wait to get old enough to be in my class. And this this little third grader walked up to me. Um, one time and um, and handed me this note after church and I opened it up and of course it was third grade handwriting which means it sort of looked like my handwriting but I'm reading it and it says Mr. Steve I can hardly wait till I get in your class and I and I realized in that moment that many people would have gotten that and so oh that's cute and thrown it away that note well, that was six months ago She's part of my class now. It still lives on my refrigerator. Oh. Because it reminds me that I can make a profound difference. In mm. life. So, but how do, how do, how do people, our audience here, how do they go about actually looking for and collecting stories that they can tell? So things that make a good story, basically, once you understand, because one of the other things people say to me, I've never done anything interesting. But actually, if you have this framing that it's just an action scene, and, and if you have the understanding that it's not about the story that you tell, it's not about the content, it's about how you tell the story. And really, we all understand that, right? We all have that one person in our life, Steve Moran, who can tell any story, and it's just fascinating. You know, we all have that one person. And we all have been stuck next to that person who we know did something interesting, but oh my gosh, when are they going to stop talking because I may actually pass out from boredom. And what's happening is the first person's following the rules, the second person isn't. And so it doesn't matter. You know, if you met somebody and they said, oh, I went to the Antarctic on this expedition and um, met this really cool scientist. And we had about like three great parties when I was there. And I saw four different kinds of wildlife. You might be like, okay. Or if you met someone who said, so Saturday morning, I get outside my front door and as the sun hits my face and I hear the front door click behind me, the excitement in the pit of my belly starts to build. I put my hands in my pocket and the money is there. This is going to happen. 
And that's a story about going to the corner store and buying a bag of chips. Like, it's not about <laughs> what you tell. It's about how you tell it. So once you recognize that it's action scenes, the s- step number one is that it's about quantity, not quality. This is a thing I wrote. I actually, like... In, a, in Another Life, I wrote a book where I interviewed stand-up comedians and my co-author, Deborah Francis White, wrote some really great essays in there about creativity. And uh, I'm going to make you a secret web page at yesyesmarsha.com forward slash foresight. So I'll link to that book. Um, but she talks about in that how when you are being creative, at the beginning, it's about quantity, not quality. So you're just trying to write down as many ideas as you can, and especially with stories, because as we said with The Boneyard, like you never know when you'll need that story. If you want to have a beginning, middle and an end, like usually if you've had a strong emotion, then that's usually like if there was a strong emotion present, that's a story. As long as you have emotional distance from it, your audience must feel safe. So don't talk about anything that you're not okay with. Um, But a strong emotion, a transformation, you know, I was this, then this happened, then I was that, a transition rather. Um, Those are good, a relationship, but it could be your relationship to this pen or your relationship to the concept of turning up on time. Um, but but usually I always say to people like what's the one that's bursting out of you like I feel like you'll look to the skies that story was bursting out of you and so when there's a story that's bursting out of you there's usually a reason and then just come back to like what are the action scenes I must have to get across you know what am I trying to get across what action scenes must I have to get across what I want to get across and then for each of those action scenes what did it look like how did you feel how did you feel how did you feel uh, so I love that. I, I I still come back to this idea that I think people have a hard time seeing stories. So mm-hmm. I've been doing uh, my first, um, actually, I, when I got, I didn't get home until 1130 or 1230 last night from this conference, late night, up at seven o'clock because the dog <laughs> had to go to the grocery store to get some food for my kids for tomorrow for my teaching while they're still donuts. And then I've been on calls all day long. But if I sat down with a piece of paper and a pencil, I could probably give you, I don't know, six or eight storylines from today. From today. Yeah. And so I guess that's the thing I, I, I struggle with. I mean, you sort of started with this early on, you know, you go to people and say, well, tell me a story. And I say, well, I don't have have anything interesting. And it's like, everything is a star story from, I'm on on TV 15 minutes ago and my dog starts barking like there's something terrified and I'm trying to get out. I want me to go out there and see what he is, but I'm on the right with Marsha. And especially somebody working in senior living, like one of the things about working in senior living is every day is not the same. (laughs) Something different happens every day. And it's about the tiny moments. And I think so often what you're trying to get across is the tiny moments. Like, is it the look that a, that a resident gave you when you handed her a cup of tea? You know, is it the, is it the tiredness that you felt as you stepped through the door, but then you saw two of your staff having a laugh in the corner and it lit you up? You know, what, what is it that's happening? What are those tiny little moments? Is it a missed opportunity? Is it about a time when you, when you were thinking, oh, I'll go and do this helpful thing for someone, but then you got too busy and then later on you feel this pang as you realized you could have, you know, done something to make someone's day better and you didn't. Like, these are tiny little things. It's not about the narrative. It's not about what you did. As long as you just include that, like, where were you and how did you feel? We're going to be able to connect to it. And that's what can be really powerful. When I run workshops, I if, if the workshop is long enough, I get participants to work on a story. So we learn all the different storytelling lessons and then we go, back and we apply them to the story but I pick the story because I don't want one person's got you know they were being chased by bears and the other person didn't do anything so I say tell me the story of what you did this morning and usually it's a morning workshop and what they did was like brush their teeth jumped in the shower checked their emails jumped on the meeting but by the end we get them to share them at the beginning and then we get them to share at the end and by the end they're like I came downstairs and as the smell of coffee hit my nose everything in my body can't you know I felt my whole body go calm and I realized today was going to be a good day you know we're like right Right there with them it's so powerful and so it's not about what you tell it's about how you tell it and you need to practice and I think another big myth is that people who are good at storytelling don't practice but Steve 
you and I have never discussed this, but because I know you, I know that you're like me. And as soon as you leave a, com you know, as soon as something happens, immediately you start writing the story in your brain. <laughs> immediately you start like thinking about it. And so then by the time you tell the story, you've kind of already practiced it a few times. So practice your stories, write down, you know, quantity over quality, then just pick one, try it out on some low stakes people, you know, on family members who love you or Facebook friends who'll just ignore you if they don't want to re respond and just practice, practice, practice. Yeah. And if you're telling stories in person, practice out loud to an empty room is fine, but practice it so it becomes second nature. Perfect. So you've got some additional resources specifically for my audience and the website is yesmarshall.com. So, yeah, so it, give me five minutes after this broadcast has ended because I knew I would have extra things I wanted to add in. And then I'm going to stick on there. I've got a list of a storytelling checklist. So you can go through it and check, does your story have all of these things? So if you want to know what all those rules are, you just carry this checklist around with you and you apply it to every story that you're telling. Um, so I'm going to add that on there. And because we've been talking so much about your keynote, I'll also stick in there the four questions to ask before you give any presentation. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. So what are the four questions? Questions you must ask yourself. So I'm going to put those two on there. If you go to yes, yes, Marsha, which is M A R S H A dot com forward slash foresight. And if you're watching this live, give me like five minutes. <laughs> I'll get it up there. there. Is. That, like that. Is that yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. That's it. Now, it won't work yet. So if, you, if you're watching live, give it about five minutes. <laughs> yeah. That, but I wanted to get it in as a banner so you could see that. Um, and, and you can contact page there if somebody says i got this burning keynote i want to have you there it's uh, all up there one thing i neglected to do that i want to give credit to my good friend denise boudreau who is actually the one that uh, connected we me with marcia and so that has made my life better and so immensely Mine grateful <laughs> to 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 you for helping make my life better to denise for connecting uh, us and um this is a wonderful conversation. I figure I, I know we're going to have to do this again and, and maybe do some sort of a more specific uh, storytelling workshop. Love so, it. Um, Love it. Can't wait. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you. We'll be back next week with something. Don't forget about Tech Tuesday with Abby. Uh, and so we love you. Thank you. Thank you so much as a professional in the industry for making a difference in the lives of your team, for making a difference in the lives of residents, for making the difference in the lives of family. I I just, I, I'm so, have so much gratitude to be a part of, of what you're actually doing in the trenches every day. So with that, thank you very much. All right, thank you.